everybody and welcome to another Facebook event. I am so happy to have by my side Justine Amder and Teresa Schumart. And today's topic, we're going to discuss the relationship between high blood pressure and sleep apnea. So welcome to you both. Thank you. So some of our objectives for today will be, we'll discuss what blood pressure really means. You've probably heard the term diastolic blood pressure versus systolic. So we will go into detail and let you know exactly what those two numbers relate to. And we'll also talk about related comorbidities that um, are related to having a high blood pressure, how that also relates to sleep apnea and how sleep apnea can cause high blood pressure. And given the times and the current situation, We'll also have a bit at the end to discuss COVID-19 and that, what that means for our patient population. So when we talk about the definition of systolic blood pressure, it's basically the pressure when the heart is contracting. So if you think about it, you know, the heart is pumping against a resistance and that resistance is your arteries. And if you think about a hose, if the hose is like wide, and it's pumping and you've got the tap turned on a little bit, the pressure is not going to be that high. But if that hose starts going like this size and becomes decreased and the pressure in the tap is still the same, then you're going to get a higher pressure. So that's basically what the heart is doing against the resistant of the arteries. And that's what we refer to as systolic blood pressure. So that is the top number. Here we see that, generally speaking, a good pressure for most of the general population would be around 120, being the systolic number, over 80 is the diastolic number, and we'll talk about that. So when we look at diastolic, it's actually the diastolics when the heart relaxes. So when you think about the heart pumping all the time, it's that pressure then that's resistant against the arteries given your systolic. So the diastolic is when the heart is actually stopped. So the artery is actually, the, the pressure is not as high because the heart isn't putting out anything, so you get a number. So after the heart finishes contracting, that's when the heart is able to refill and then start all over again. So this period of ventricular uh, relaxation, again, is called the diastole. And the blood pressure during diastole is called diastolic pressure, meaning the lower number. So that 80 number that we spoke of earlier would be the diastolic pressure. Now, a lot of people are concerned about the blood pressure with their higher number, and they, they talk about how high it is. But you also don't want a higher diastolic pressure because it does mean that the arteries haven't had a chance to relax during that diastolic phase, and there's still quite a considerable resistance, okay? Now, that could be related to atherosclerosis, like a buildup of plaque in the artery, or just the fact that they're constricted for so long due to high blood pressure that then with the, they don't have the opportunity to relax when the heart relax, okay? Now, keeping track of blood pressure, again, like we said, the normal would be, you know, less than 120. Now, that is related to age. When I did look at the American Heart Association, they generally speak uh, of uh, blood pressure less than, I think they said 140, right up to the age of 75. So, depending on age, weight, other comorbidities, if you smoke, um, if you've had high cholesterol, for example, if you're, again, overweight, all these things can contribute to a higher blood pressure, which, of course, you don't want. So when we look at an elevated blood pressure, we're looking at, say, someone who's in their 40s, anything over 120 systolic, over 80 diastolic would be regarded as elevated. Now, some of the things that you can do related to getting your blood pressure down is, again, um, like we spoke about before when we talked about uh, heart failure, is exercise, diet, low sodium, and, um, you know, weight reduction. 
So before I bring Teresa in, I just also want to talk about high blood pressure and how it's diagnosed. But when you're looking at 140 or higher in your systolic range, the higher number, it's almost like high blood pressure can be regarded as the silent killer. Because really, we don't really know. How do you know if you've got high blood pressure if you're not getting a check regularly? Some of the things that can happen to people is, you know, they can develop headaches. Maybe their vision's a little bit impaired. They may have floaters. I've heard of people saying, you know, they see floaters and it's when they're stressed or the, somebody said to me, I see a mosquito. Um, and, and then they realize then that it's because they're stressed and their blood pressure is high. When we look at a hypertensive crisis, which can be quite critical, and we'll talk about that later, that's when your high blood pressure gets to the systolic number 180 or above. So, Teresa, if you don't mind sharing, I know we talked about this earlier, and you are um, on currently medication for high blood pressure, and I'm just curious to see how and when that was diagnosed. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, actually, it was diagnosed when I was uh, about 55 years old. And uh, apparently, it just sort of appeared one day, <laughs> as far as I was concerned, because I, did, I wasn't a sickly person, so I wasn't at the doctor very often. Now, earlier, I had had five children, so in my, you know, in my 20s and early 30s, I was, you know, having children and, you know, you would get your blood pressure taken on a regular basis then uh, when you were doing for uh, pregnancy visits. And everybody was like, oh, you're fine. You're fine. You're doing well. You're doing well. And I never thought about it. And then when I'd have to go get a checkup, you know, in my 40s, I no problem. And then one day somebody said, oh, well, it's a little high. You know, I might have been like maybe 52 or so then. And lo and behold, at age 55, then it started cranking up there, <laughs> you know, and they would. And, and then, you know, but I didn't get on medicine, though, until I was probably 59. And, but by then I had all kinds of other issues, you know, so. Well, and that's the thing, you know, like I said earlier on, it can be the silent killer. And we'll talk about that later in some slides. But, you know, high blood pressure can be related to so many other comorbidities. So, Justine, if I wouldn't mind pulling you in, um, and do you have any experience with um, you or yourself or somebody that's close to you that had issues or related comorbidities before we go into it in more detail? Uh, related to high blood pressure? Uh, well, with my family history, um, not necessarily high blood pressure. Um, my uh, stepfather, not related by, by blood, um, I know that he struggles with, uh, with that. Um, right now, it's a little difficult uh, because he would, he would often go to those um, stations that they have at pharmacies, you know, CVS, Walgreens. And if he was out and about for the day, he would, you know, pop in, get use that machine to get his blood pressure checked. And if it was, you know, beyond the range that the physician said, he would give them a call. Um, right now, obviously, those things aren't happening because um, everyone's kind of staying at home, sheltering at home. Um, so um, that's pretty much my experience with that. I, and I, I think you know, your um, description of it being, um, you know, silent is, is exactly right because, you know, there aren't uh, as many maybe visual clues or, you know, things that you're feeling that, you know, would prompt you to immediately call your doctor and say, hey, you know, you cut your finger, it's bleeding, what do I do? You see that, you feel it, you see everything going on, you know, it's not that type of situation. So, it's, it's definitely something to keep you know, in the back of your mind. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking about that just as you say it, there's so many other um, diseases or, you know, syndromes that are um, diagnosed or it takes a lot to actually figure out if you have that diagnosis or syndrome. And high blood pressure is a really easy test. 
But unless you're going to your doctor, and a lot of us, you know, when we're younger, I mean, I never had physicals in my 20s or 30s. It was only maybe when I was 40 that I started getting regular physicals with my doctor. Of course, being a nurse, there's always times where I would, you know, be curious and just check my blood pressure or, you know, do that. But for the general population, it's not a test. It's a simple test, but it's not a test that we usually do. Now, with related comorbidities that um, can be attributed to high blood pressure, it's huge. So we do know, and thankfully now that sleep medicine is becoming more the forefront of a lot of physicians' um, studies, we know that sleep apnea and high blood pressure have both been linked to significantly increased uh, risk of stroke and heart attack. So it's not to be taken lightly. Stroke is the leading uh, cause of death and disability in adults. And one study showed that um, every 40 seconds in the States, somebody has a stroke. Now, that can be uh, an ischemic stroke that they relate to a blood clot, um, where it cuts off a little bit of the circulation of the brain, or usually more devastating and um, is, has increased mortality can be a hemorrhagic stroke. So, you know, where a vessel in the brain is a little bit weak, maybe because there's an aneurysm there, or the vessel, again, is a little bit weak. And because of that high blood pressure and the pressure that's um, induced in those arteries, it bleeds into the brain. So, you know, I, it's not something that should be taken lightly. Um, and um, it's something that, you know, we should all be aware of when we do have sleep apnea or people that are not diagnosed as having sleep apnea that um, should know their blood pressure. Now, if you do have a heart attack, you know, people regard heart attacks as myocardial infarction. You may hear that term. And um, that occurs basically because of many reasons, but it can be attributed to high blood pressure. And the coronary arteries, the arteries that serve the heart, are very, very minute. So if they're bogged down with um, atherosclerosis or plaque, it means that the pressure can't get to there, the, the circulation can't get to serve that heart, and um, it either has a thrombus, a clot, and that part of the heart dies. Now, you may hear people saying, you know, I had a myocardial infarction because it's the myocardium, the muscle of the heart, that dies because of the reduced oxygen. So again, um, all these things can be attributed to high blood pressure. Um, and definitely sleep apnea is a major, major factor in that diagnosis. Now, I did talk to Teresa before we go to the next slide. It's been a while since I had a uh, sleep study, and um, I was curious because I actually did forget whether, high, you know, whether blood pressure was monitored during my sleep study. And Teresa, do you want to just speak a little bit to that? Yes. Um, most of the time um, in any of the labs that I worked in, that wasn't a common practice to check the blood pressure. I did notice that in some hospitals that maybe were um, where the director of the sleep center was a nurse, then it would be done. And I thought that, well, that's very interesting. And you being a nurse, I think that that's, you know, you have a very good a grip on what blood pressure is all about and you know and I wonder you know had that been something that we had to do as sleep technicians if, if that would have made me more in tune because I think I would have been like you I would have been checking mine <laughs> you know? so I might have known it during those years and you know during the years that I was abusing my body of staying up all night every night, you know, plus all the dietary issues with things and stuff. So yeah, I, I think that it, I think that it should be done, but it, it isn't commonplace. 
that yeah. I, I should say that it isn't commonplace and i'm not saying that's right or it's wrong but i just wish that it had been done in my labs <laughs> yeah no and before i go to the next slide i mean I, i'm thinking of some of our patients that we see you know i work in a kidney transplant unit and see post kidney transplant patients for some of the time and um Sometimes people come in and, um, you know, their, their blood pressure is high. So we've all heard the term white coat syndrome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that is definitely a syndrome that um, people are anxious. They go to their doctor and um, I could be taking their blood pressure, but it's just the whole anxiety related to being in that physician's office or a clinical setting makes their blood pressure elevated. So I'm always a big, you know, proponent of saying, you know, have a machine at home if you can. We did talk about, you know, the idea or the facility to, or the opportunity, should I say, to be able to check your blood pressure at um, a pharmacy or Walgreens or CVS. Um, bear in mind, a lot of these machines aren't regularly calibrated, so keep that open. But, um, you know, we're not going to base a change in medication on one reading, for example. So a lot of times we will do what we call a halter monitor or 24-hour BP. I slapped on cuffs on many of the people and say, go home, and then we'll upload the data. And then we'll just see when you're at home what it is. And it's basically a better, truer reading um, when you're relaxed at home, and there definitely we get sleep um, readings as well, um, to dictate whether there's a change warranted in the dose of the medication. So, you know, it is a simple test. If you feel like, you know, you do have it or there's a heredity component or, you know, you, you're, you do have headaches that aren't going away, maybe that's an idea to get... Um, what we call a 24 hour BP monitor installed. So that's, that could be good. Good to know. Now, when I did look as well, of course, sleep apnea, and when I did do research um, a while ago about um, our, our um, you know, heart failure, it's almost again, like I say, when you're not breathing and your lungs are closed, right? And bear in mind, sleep is repair. We always think that sleep is just like, okay, I just go to sleep and I wake up, but hormones are repairing everything's going to like go okay we're all at rest now we're all relaxed this is where we're all going to get good again for the next day if you're having all these arousals during the night it's going to shock you into a system where your blood pressure is going to become elevated so again that's why osa or obstructive sleep apnea of course is extremely common in patients that have high blood pressure. They do recommend or, or um, have said that it probably about, I think I saw 20 to 30% of people with high blood pressure were found to have sleep apnea. So it's difficult to control that blood pressure when your body is not at rest and sleeping adequately. And if you're having multiple arousals during the night, um, it does shock you, you know, it's that fight or flight syndrome where your blood pressure is going to become high. But think about it another way when we talked about heart failure is, again, your heart is beating against your lungs that are closed. So the resistance is going to get higher. Mm -hmm. That resistance against the arteries is going to get higher and higher. And then those arteries lose their elasticity so they don't relax. So when we talked earlier about diastolic pressure relaxing, that's when those arteries become so constricted that when they do relax, they're not relaxing adequately enough, okay? So again, when people get hung up on, my blood pressure is 160, um, but you know they might always talk about the higher number. Don't forget the lower number again, because that can be an indication of even if your blood pressure was 120, but the lower number was 90 or 95 or 100, that means it's not relaxing enough and you're still having a high resistance during diastole. Okay? So, Teresa, if I can pull you in again, um, 
when we talk about medication and, um, you know, sleep apnea and being associated with high blood pressure, how, how has that worked for you? Are you monitoring your blood pressure? Is your doctor monitoring regular? Because they do recommend that if you're on medication, you should get your blood pressure monitored at least every three to six months. Yes. Uh, well, I go to the doctor pretty often. I, I go about every four months because I have some issues other than uh, the blood pressure. But I am controlled. Uh, my diabetes and my um, blood pressure are controlled with the medication. Now, what I am looking for um, is for springtime to really set itself down in my backyard <laughs> so, so that I can actually be outside. I've been growing things in the house, uh, you know, little seedlings, because once I'm outside, then I know that I'll have the exercise to be able to help that along. And, you know, the medicine won't have to work as hard to keep my blood pressure low. And I'll be well, you just know how you feel when you're outdoors, you know, yeah. and you're you're doing something that you enjoy and the air is fresh. I mean, that just makes your whole body feel yeah. wonderful. So, I, I mean, I'm glad that I have the medicine. Don't get me wrong. But I want to do some more things to make it healthier for my blood pressure. So. You know, I, I've had experience where I've said to people, we we be we do a BP true, so our machines now do a blood pressure. You can set it, but it generally does it every minute. I try and give a couple of minutes in between, and we usually do five. So um, I always say to people, go to your happy place. And I've had situations where I've had patients in clinic where their blood pressure has been one eighty over one hundred five, for example, and I leave them. And I turn off the lights and I say, the blood pressure is going to go off for the next minute for the next six times, for example. And then the average may be as low as 130s, 140s, because you're right. Things that you enjoy, relaxation, you know, not being stressed, all that has implications to your blood pressure. So if you're normally high as well, you want to avoid situations like this. And obviously there's some we can. If we have a stressful job, a stressful living situation, worries, finances during this awful time. But you want to take time. And actually, when you were saying that, I wanted to breathe. You know, you want to breathe and just be in the moment. So I'm glad that's helped you as well, because that is very beneficial um, information for people. Just to take a moment and just, I always say, go to your happy place. Well, it, we we owe it to ourselves to become more uh, concerned with our wellness. If we don't do it for ourselves, who is going to do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, we have to take control of that and say, I own this and I'm going to change it so that I'm living my best uh, life. So, yeah. Absolutely. And you can, because I've oh, seen the evidence, yeah. you know, on a, on a monitor, I've seen it like, go, oh, wow, that's like mm -hmm. decreased just because you've relaxed. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's good advice, good advice. Justine, anything to add to that about, um, you know, blood pressure or stress related to sleep apnea? Well, I, I think nowadays... Um, you know, there's a lot out there for people to get some insight on um, relaxation and meditation. I mean, you know, it, it, there's very popular apps and, and things you can do on the computer. And I even see sometimes um, one of the Sunday uh, morning shows that just says, you know, take two minutes and watch the animals at Yellowstone Park, you know, uh, on the video, you hear the like, like as Teresa was saying, the wind, the breeze, the brook, you know, just look at nature and hear all of those little sounds for a couple of minutes. So there's definitely things out there, I think, probably more now than ever that yeah. can help people if they're interested in, you know, following some sort of meditation schedule or uh, a, a guided calm, calming exercises. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. Yeah, and it's amazing the body's response to external focus or 
external stimuli. And I mean, you know, it's it goes prehistoric to the fact that, you know, we were on our guard before when we were, you know, fighting with dinosaurs or fighting for our lives. And it is that fight or flight um, aspect. But if you take a moment and just, you know, lose all that and relax it, it you know, again, I've seen it. And I've seen the other idea of um, somebody getting really angry when I was doing their blood pressure at their uh, parents <laughs> and his blood pressure went really elevated. And I'm like, okay, just relax. And then it came down, you know. But, you know, obviously we all know about sleep apnea and how it relates to um, our airway and suffocation and, um, you know, uh, some of the signs and symptoms that we have to be aware of for people that may be unsure if they do have it or not. Um, and again, we always advocate, you know, have a test, have your sleep partner let you know if you're snoring or you're stopping breathing and that should be an indication to go and get a sleep study. But, you know, some of the other ideas that we have or, or signs and symptoms are morning headaches or, you know, feeling fatigue all the time or just foggy. And don't think like I did years ago that it was just related to getting old because it's not, you know, and it was related to sleep apnea, not your job or your stress. So, you know, go and get that um, sleep study done when, when available and, and get the normal airflow into your body and into your organs and, and um, get that oxygen going, you know, because you don't have it when you've got sleep apnea and you're stopping breathing every minute, you know, or more. So when we look at sleep apnea and we look at the high blood pressure link, um, again, like I said, you know, sleep is um, repair. It's not just relax. Um, we do relax, obviously, and we hope we're in a relaxed state. And, um, but our bodies are also repairing. It's like saying, you know, I'm asleep now. My body's going to get all the hormones together, all the vital oxygen to my organs, and let's get ready for the next day. So if you're not getting that, then um, you're not getting ready for the next day and your body's not repaired and you're feeling tired and your organs are going to damage and, you know, your blood pressure is going to get worse. And if you do have hypertension or, you know, it's regarded as hypertension, um, it's going to become increasingly worse because you're not in a relaxed state. They do say that 83% of drug-resistant hypertension patients, like I said earlier, a high number, also have sleep apnea. And half of obstructive sleep apnea patients may also have hypertension. So it's, you know, get that's why I was curious when I talked to Teresa earlier that um, I was wondering why maybe blood pressure cuffs aren't put on patients when they're having a sleep study because the data should also go hand in hand, okay? So again, think about it like that. When you've got sleep apnea, it's going to exacerbate your already hypertensive state. But if you have sleep apnea, you're more prone to hypertension. So, you know, some consequences of untreated sleep apnea, like I said, is resistant hypertension. And some people, you know, are resistant to the medication and it takes a lot of titration. Um, a doctor is not going to say, okay, for example, Teresa, here you go, take this magic pill and you're fine. It takes work to make sure that that pill is suitable for you. And there's many out there like ACE inhibitors, um, blood pressure medication with a diuretic, for example, that'll take care of some of the fluid. Um, but we also should be, as well as doing um, monitoring our blood pressure regularly and treating it with medication, we also should be mindful of the fact that we can use some of our um, treatments ourselves, i.e. lose weight, exercise, if you smoke, stop, um, if you drink, cut down, um, and watch the sodium in your diet, because all these then can contribute to heart disease. High blood pressure is a big, big, major factor in kidney disease. 
because the kidney is a very intricate system of filtrating um, and sorting out sodium potassium exchange but in the kidney the little vessels are very very small so if you're not getting that sodium and potassium exchange and water um, water excretion um, and your fluid retensive that'll damage your kidneys through time and we've also seen you know the result of sleep apnea causing um, or untreated uh, sleep apnea causing diabetes um, so you know it's not to be taken lightly and again i go back to the fact that hypertension is a cuff on your arm you know or the diagnosis of and a reading so it's something that should be routinely checked especially if you're overweight you smoke and you have um hypertension in your family i would suggest you get it checked okay so the good news is, of course, is there always a good news? We'll, we'll end on a high. Um, if you have sleep apnea, get treatment and be adherent to the treatment. Like, I, I wear that mask every night. Um, again, research suggests that anywhere between 30 to 50% uh, of patients with high blood pressure are better once they get treatment, um, once they're on that um, machine. And Teresa, if I can pull you in there, because I, I know you were recently um, a user of CPAP, but maybe you were diagnosed with hypertension a little bit prior to that. Did that change? It didn't change anything for the sleep apnea, but, um, you know, it, it definitely got, my blood pressure got uh, controlled. Mm -hmm. So I don't see you, you, you had a name for the things that you were seeing. You see the little spots or whatever. my mother used to say, and I, and I can think back now in my teenage years that my mother was of that age where her, maybe her blood pressure was going. And she would tell me, I see these little amoebas in the yeah. air. I yeah. see amoebas, amoebas. And I, I started seeing those around the same, but I was, I, I didn't know what that meant, you know, and you said it. And I thought, well, that should have been a clue for yeah. me, but I didn't know about that. So interesting. Yeah, no, and again, I mean, I think all these things just be aware of because mm -hmm. if you're not having your blood pressure checked, um, then you don't know. But mm -hmm. those floaters are, or is floaters, some, I think, yes. <laughs> related to me. They says, I have the mosquito. There's a mosquito <laughs> here, you know? And, um, you know, once they had their blood pressure checked, it, it, it was elevated. So little things like that that are off the norm. And again, it's such a simple test. It really you know? is. It really is. I, I, I just wish so much that I had uh, been aware or more, and, you know, or made myself aware. I could have learned anything I wanted to, yeah. but I just wasn't, I, I wasn't aware of my own situation, you know? Yeah. So, you know, when we look as well as an adjunct um, treatment, or we always say when you're on medication and you have something else, CPAP is regarded as an effective treatment or adjunct treatment, meaning with your, both your medication and your CPAP therapy in serving as a potential um, treatment for these high-risk patients that we would regard as resistant hypertensive patients meaning they're on one or two, three agents, hypertensive agents, okay? Right. So normally speaking, you know, a lot of people are on one. Um, I did hear before from a lot of basically um, the male population because, you know, every medication has a drawback. And a lot of males may have issues with their antihypertensive medication and feel that they are better on it. And then once they check their blood pressure and think, yeah, I'm doing good. I don't have these symptoms anymore and I'll just come off it. And to be honest with you, I have seen a lot of patients with hypertensive bleeds into the brain that stopped their medication or was non-adherent. So it's not to be taken lightly either. If you're on medication, take it as prescribed every day, the day and time it's prescribed. Okay. 
and you may feel better or you may not see the floaters or mosquito or amoebas, <laughs> but keep taking the medication you're prescribed mm -hmm. until your primary Absolutely. care or your doctor tells you otherwise because it's very serious. Yeah. Okay. Now, by identifying the most effective combination of treatments for patients with sleep apnea and high blood pressure, the lower the patient's risk, of course, uh, will be potentially, you know, lower for the risk of complications. So if we do treat our sleep apnea and we treat our hypertension, then the risks of um, developing um, something else is going to be diminished. Okay, so again, we talk about adjunct treatment or therapy. So that may be you need antihypertensive anti medication plus um, a CPAP. Okay. So before we go on to the big topic of the, uh, I was saying the century and decade, but I guess it is the century. Um, any points, Justine or Teresa, before we leave hypertension? Um, I think that the recommendation of, uh, you know, making sure you have your annual physical, no matter what uh, age group that you're in, even if you're in your you know, early 30s or something like that, just to, you know, all of these things can creep up on you that you're not aware of. And, you know, your doctor can, like you said, it's so easy to check your blood pressure, um, you know, or, or, or um, and, and stay on top of those things. I think that that's a great, you know, recommendation to, to everybody out there. And, um, you know, if you are in the process of care and treatment for whatever uh, condition that you have, um, stick with the plan. Don't be changing it. Talk to your doctor and, and, you know, and uh, keep, keep up on those appointments yeah. because that's how you're going to be able to tell if there's fluctuations and changes or something needs to be, um, you know, tweaked a little bit in regards to, to your care or treatment. Sure. Anything from you, Teresa, last minute? Um, Just to comment. echo what Justine said, it's very much... Uh, you know, desired that people with, you know, any of the risk factors for the COVID-19 virus, you know, be extra careful. We don't want anybody um, in danger out there. We just wish everybody the best. We're, we're trying to keep all our families healthy, and we hope that you do as well. Yeah. You know, when we look at COVID-19, of course, it's a big topic. Um, it's near and dear to myself. Um, I am currently working, uh, I've been redeployed and working in the COVID assessment center here in Toronto and at St. Mike's Hospital. And, you know, we're certainly seeing numbers coming through our doors every day and people wanting tests and we're trying to test. Um, we don't have the capacity to test everybody and you'll only test people that are either symptomatic and we'll go through some of those in a minute um or who are on the front line um and who actually need to be tested to make sure they're able to work if that makes sense so we're checking people like paramedics nurses doctors um public um, workers, even in grocery stores that are essential services, so that their employers know that they are not at risk of um, passing this virus on to anyone else. So, you know, when we look at things like, um, I know in our awake page, there's been a lot of um, questions and concerns regarding COVID-19. And of course, that's all justified and, and people are nervous and people are anxious and people think that if they have a syndrome, a disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, am I more prone? So if we take a step back and I realize that, you know, I did share something like that before on, on, on the page saying, you know, wash your hands. So the idea is not to even contract it in the first place. So be mindful, adhere to social distancing, um, wash your hands and, and use sanitizer, wash them. I always say recite the alphabet when you're washing your hands and um, so that you're doing it for a good 25 to 30 seconds. 
don't forget your thumbs, and then don't touch your face. Some people, um, when they're wearing gloves, feel like, you know, I have gloves that's carried in your hands. Well, no, I see people even in our hospitals wearing gloves and they're scratching their nose or they're touching their eyes because they think it grows on hands. Well, it's actually growing on your gloves. So don't feel like by wearing gloves, it's giving you protection against getting it in your hands because you're not getting it in your hands, you're getting it in your gloves. And if you put your gloves to your face or your clothes or whatever, then it's being transferred. Um, so, you know, some of the signs and symptoms that you want to be aware of um, uh, is basically that we ask is runny nose, headache. Um, some people recently have um, uh, admitted or we've found that people have lost their taste or smell. Um, there's a GI component. Some people have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and, you know, but generally speaking, it's like that flu-like symptom. So, you know, the headache, the fever, the chills, the body aches, the muscle weakness. And most people, thankfully, will get over it. But when we throw in comorbidities and we throw in things like um, sleep apnea and high blood pressure or heart disease, there is literature. And bear in mind, this is changing. It actually changes every day. Our protocols are changing every day, you know, as to what we're doing, what the results are, who we're swabbing. But if you are unfortunate enough to catch this virus, then the idea is to keep hydrated. Um, of course, some of the people that die, and it's not, it's indiscriminate. I feel this, this virus is indiscriminate, and it's um, actually touching people that are maybe regarded as healthy. But if you've got heart disease, there's a component there that maybe you may develop the virus worse. If you have COPD, for example, it may be worse because if it gets in your lungs and you already have diminished um, airways that are clogged, then, you know, the virus is going to attach to those and pneumonia and, you know, everything will, will happen that it could be more detrimental for you. Um, you know, so unfortunately, that can be the case when people are, are, are sick. But I don't feel that, um, you know, having somebody get the virus is, you know, if we have something like heart disease, high blood pressure, heart failure, coronary artery disease, uh, you know, COPD, are you going to be worse off? Some of the literature suggests you may be. So again, you know, things that are put in place is, you know, gloves, regular hand washing, wearing masks, um, social distancing, don't have somebody over to your house. Um, and, and if you go out to the store, um, people are wearing masks. And I, I kind of chuckle to myself seeing people driving down the street in their own um, wearing a mask. And I'm thinking, why? But if you're sick, you should certainly wear a mask if you, have to, if you have to go out in public. And, you know, one of the bigger things that we're all concerned of in the healthcare field is, you know, there's 10 to 20 percent of people that are what we would regard as asymptomatic, but come back positive. And what do you do with that? So basically speaking, they are recommended to quarantine for at least 14 days to see if they do develop symptoms. And of course, if they do develop symptoms, you should not go to work or you should not be around people. And you should self-isolate even if you live with somebody at home, meaning don't share the same bed, have a separate bathroom. If you can't, make sure it's clean. And I've told people, if they only have one bathroom, take everything out of it. And just keep a minimal, minimalistic look and make sure everything is doused with um, disinfectant and bleach afterwards. Now, exercise and eating healthy is important. There's a lot of people out there and it is kind of funny and it's not getting funny anymore because we're going into this longer than anticipated. But people are eating more. <laughs> people are drinking more. People aren't exercising because gyms are closed. But there's a lot out there that um, is online that you can do at home. And I'm not just talking about cutting your own hair, <laughs> you know, which we, we will get to, I'm sure. 
Um, but, you know, there's exercises that you can do at home. A friend of mine said she just bought a, a skipping rope and she's doing that. But if you can, get outside. Fresh air is good. Um, so get outside. Get enough sleep. Um, wear your mask at night. Manage your stress and, and eat a balanced diet. So all these things will help you prevent actually contracting the virus itself. Anything you guys want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think that uh, trying to maintain some routine, you know, throughout the day, even though you are at home, if you can work at home or come up with some sort of schedule with, uh, you know, your family or for yourself. And, um, you know, if we've been able to take, you know, neighborhood walks or bike rides because there's enough space here uh, for my family personally to be able to, to, to do that. Um, so, you know, we've tried to do those things. And, and as I said before, you know, there's a lot of resources out there for the calming and the meditation and all that. There's actually been a lot um, recently, as you were talking about exercises that, you know, people are offering them free online for a couple of weeks. So, you know, um, it always doesn't have to be something that you have to spend money on. You know, you could just sign up for a couple of weeks with, you know, some uh, famous trainer in Los Angeles <laughs> and take her or his class for a couple of weeks and then, you know, find something else. So I think it's, um, you know, there are resources out there to, to be able to. And then, you know, uh, not long ago, Teresa and I spoke with, uh, Dr. Grandner, who is a um, mental health expert out of the University of Arizona. Uh, and one thing that he did say to us was, you know, you don't have to put a lot of pressure on yourself either. You know, um, so if you don't happen to exercise or go on the walk or whatever, it's okay. It's okay for one day. You right. know, you can regroup and get it on the next day. So, you right. know, you don't have to make yourself feel like you're supposed to be doing all of these things all the time too when you're home. Maybe you do just need to relax today, tomorrow, and you know, you'll get back on, on your schedule as well. Absolutely. Anything from you, Teresa? No, I, I just do believe that um, if anybody was having any issues, you know, with their mental health at this time and maybe keeping their blood pressure <laughs> in check if they're having a lot of stress it would be worthwhile going into our youtube channel and looking for the dr grandner interview which i believe was on maybe the uh what day last week or so I, maybe yeah. the 14th or something mm -hmm. anyway it was it was it was just recently and uh, it, it would be worth uh, listening to because he really gave some good points about, you know, if you're having a lot of stress right now. So. You know, and the good thing with our um, sleep apnea group or our awake group is like we have a community there. So share, support, and um, give us little tips. Tell us what you're doing. Um, tell us how you're getting through it um, and share for other people that may be lost and don't really know what to do. And bear in mind, there's a lot of people out there that are living on their own that may be dependent on people coming into them every day for either care or home health, for example, or, you know, just to do their cleaning. And that may not be happening anymore. But if it is, make sure the people that are coming into your home are abiding by, you know, social distancing as much as possible. But certainly, yeah, share out there and, and, and tell us what you're doing. I love the idea of like, you know, no pressure. Um, there, we do feel like, you know, some of us that maybe aren't working um, have a lot of time, but there's also things that you think, oh, I just can't get to this right now. That's okay. You'll get to it, you know. But just take care of yourself because we actually just don't know when this is going to end. So, you know, be supportive of each other and, and um, take care of each other. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you and all of your fellow uh, teammates that, uh, that you work with on a daily basis for being out there on the front line and, and helping all of those in your community and everybody, you know, around the world that's, that's helping patients. Um, we really appreciate uh, 
you know, your service and everybody that, that's working with you. Um, so I just want to say personally for me, and I'm sure our whole community, you know, thank you. Thank you for your help. And thank you for taking the time out of your new uh, work schedule and busy week to, to, to join us uh, uh, for this session today. I think it was, it was really helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Justine. Thank you. And we'll, we'll get through it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So as, as always, we'll be available when um, this is pushed live to answer your questions and concerns. And um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and stay safe.